Hi everyone, welcome to The Enthusiastic Buddhist. In today's video, I want to address a question about how we can practice the Buddhist path while still living in samsara. You see, it's not uncommon that as our practice and interest in following the Buddhist teaching grows, that it will also have an effect on how we choose to spend our time in our daily life. For instance, we might find that we become less interested in the usual worldly pleasures like getting drunk with friends or work colleagues and this can create some friction in our lives. The question I received about this comes from Vision who said, Hi Minda, for the Q&A you can help me with something that has been on my mind for a long time. How can we be efficient at practicing Buddhism while living in the samsara? I'm finding it increasingly difficult to live in the modern Western world and honestly what I would like to do the most is move to Asia and live in a Buddhist temple or go live in an isolated place where I can focus on meditation and leading a life following Buddhism. I have zero interest in, the modern, in this modern world. I don't care about luxuries or houses or cars or women or sex or money or getting promoted at my job. Actually, I have a hard time connecting with co-workers since they all drink and I don't. They all get together on weekends and they go out partying and I'm always left out because their world is tremendously uninteresting to me. This is just one of the many examples I could go on. But in short, how do you manage to remain in the samsara while being a Buddhist and not constantly struggle with all the defilements of this world? And also Wei Zhou said, I'm experiencing similar situation too. Sometimes I feel like sharing my insights with my friends because I've been through what they're experiencing now. However, people have different perspectives and life is an individual journey. No need or no right to force anything on anyone who is not ready. But it causes some struggle for me as Vision mentioned in his comment. Minda, could you share your insight on this? Alright, so the first thing I want to say is that as we start adopting Buddhist values and living a life more in accord with the teachings, it's only natural that change is going to happen and that things that once seemed interesting to you won't appeal to you anymore. This is really what we call renunciation in Buddhism. It's not that you have to try and give up certain things, but that you see that there's no real benefit in doing them anymore. So they simply fall away from your interests on their own accord. I remember reading the analogy that renunciation is like leaving your childhood toys behind. You simply lose your fascination with those toys and you outgrow them. You know, it's just a, a natural dropping away of things that don't serve you anymore. So as worldly desires become less fascinating for you, then of course this, this is going to change the dynamics of some of your relationships, especially if you're expected to do activities that you're no longer interested in. I mean, as we start practicing the Buddha's teachings, you will begin to see the futility of certain activities like getting drunk all the time. It would be great if we could all find happiness and become enlightened by getting drunk. <laughs> but due to your increasing wisdom, you will, you will realize that it doesn't bring everlasting happiness or release you from suffering. And this can happen with lots of things, not just, not just drinking. As Vision said, we can start losing interest in otherworldly pursuits like chasing things like luxuries, relationships and houses. And the reason we lose interest in them is because we're starting to see through the fake promises that these things can bring us everlasting happiness. We start to see that everything has a good and a bad side and that there isn't anything we can obtain out there that is 100% perfect, permanent or infallible. It's just as the Buddha said that everything is subject to change and therefore nothing external can be relied on to bring us ultimate happiness. And when we have this realization and we see things with a more balanced mind, then what's happening is that we're really starting to wake up. And rather than being a negative thing, you can think of these changes more like a butterfly outgrowing its cocoon. What is happening is a true spiritual realization. 
It's very similar to what the Buddha experienced when he was living in his palace with all his luxuries. He realized that these things weren't bringing him the true peace and happiness. So what did he do? He renounced his palace life and went and ordained himself as a monk so that he could commit himself full time to the practice. Now I'm not saying that we all have to become ordained, but if it is something you're interested in exploring, then why not? If you see that modern life alone isn't going to fulfill all your happiness, then that is definitely a very valid reason for someone to consider becoming a monastic. And maybe, just maybe, practicing the Buddha's path that does promise everlasting peace and happiness by reaching Nirvana is actually an attractive alternative. So if you are starting to feel this strong desire to remove yourself from society and become a monastic, then I'd say, why not follow your heart? If it is a path you're meant to follow, you'll find that everything will fall into place for you. And you can also try, try it just for a short time. For instance, you can go to Thailand and try one of their temporary ordination programs where you can live as a monastic for a few months and get a sense of whether it's really what you want to do without having to commit for a lifetime. But of course, being a monastic isn't for everyone. So what do we do when we start feeling that worldly activities are becoming less interesting for us? What do we do when we don't want to do what everyone else is doing? <laughs> this is where the challenge comes. I mean, we certainly can practice Buddhism as a lay person in the Western world, but it will come with some challenges because you naturally won't want to engage in certain activities that seem futile to you now. So how do you approach this? Should we speak to our friends about our new insights? Maybe, <laughs> if you think it, they might be open to them. But as it was mentioned before, we all have our ind individual paths to walk. So not everyone is going to understand our new perspective on life, especially a Buddhist perspective, which actually challenges the usual things that society says will bring us happiness. So it might not make a big difference if we try to explain to others what we're thinking and feeling because they simply won't understand. I mean, you can certainly try, but unless people realize things for themselves, trying to explain it can be like a dog trying to explain walking on land to a fish. <laughs> they just don't quite have the same frame of reference to see things from your point of view. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to end all our friendships or barricade ourselves in our houses. <laughs> I mean, it might just mean that we become a bit more selective about the type of social gatherings that we attend and in the case of friendships where we have a deeper connection we may need to find a different way to socialize perhaps we can swap drinking at the bar for catching up for coffee or you could do some sports together basically you don't necessarily need to lose your friendships especially if you happen to have a deeper connection with these people I mean, true friendship is usually built on something stronger than just common activities. So it should be possible to find another way to socialize with friends without there being any friction. But if the relationships can't survive, then that's not the end of the world. I mean, we all know that as we grow older, our friendships tend to, tend to change. Some fall away and we find new ones. So maybe we need to look at making new friends that have similar views to us and ones where we can support each other in our spiritual life and not cause more friction. I mean, even the Buddha said that it's better to be alone than to enjoy the company of fools. He said, if for company you cannot find a wise and prudent friend who leads a good life, then like a king who leaves behind a conquered kingdom, or like a lone elephant in the elephant forest. You should go your way alone. Better it is to live alone. There is no fellowship with a fool. Live alone and do no evil. Be carefree like an elephant in the elephant forest. And this is why the Buddha placed so much importance on the idea of Sangha, a community that, f that follows his teachings. Because when we have spiritual friends, 
that in many ways becomes a new family for us. It gives us the confidence to practice the Buddha's teachings and lead a lifestyle that feels good for us. If you have Buddhist friends, they're not going to ask you to engage in mundane pursuits that creates friction for your Buddhist values. Instead, they're going to keep your mind in the Dharma because your conversations will naturally have a Buddhist flavour to them. Personally, I love my Dharma friends and I let go of a lot of long-term friendships I used to have. I mean, not everyone understood my enthusiasm for Buddhism and it's not up to me to try and convince others. And when you no longer have such strong shared interests, those friendships will naturally be less strong. But what I have found is that when you invest your time in the activities that are spiritually beneficial and you follow your heart, your joy in practicing Buddhism will outshine any mundane joy that you got from previous friendships. And this joy you get from practicing the Buddha's path will also give you the confidence to move on from certain friendships without being scared of being isolated. Because when you have the Dharma in your heart, that is the true refuge. That is what brings you safety and peace. That can't come from friends outside. It has to come from within. And it does when you're really committed to the path and practicing. It might not happen straight away, so it might take time before you feel confident in your practice to be able to navigate some of these social challenges, and that's okay. Just take things slowly, continue your practice, and things will take their natural course, whatever that might be. But I can see from your questions that you're both really trying to embody the Buddhist teachings as part of your life, and so this friction will naturally arise. But as I said, rather than seeing it as a negative thing, try to see it as a natural stepping stone on the path to insight. So we're going to face these challenges and this is why having a Dharma family really becomes important in my opinion. And this is why I really encourage people to try and find local Buddhist communities to become part of or to find Buddhist communities online. So hopefully this has been helpful. I know we're, we've only just touched on this issue and how it affects our friendships in particular. At least you know now that you're, what you're experiencing is very common. I think probably everyone practicing the Buddhist teachings or practicing meditation seriously will face the same challenges. So you're not alone in this, okay? And I'm sure if you continue to practice the Buddha's teachings, you will find a way to overcome these challenges because they're really a small bump on the spiritual path, not a roadblock. In fact, they're there to help point us onwards and upwards in terms of our spiritual progress. So that's all for me for now. Take care everyone, have a great week, and I hope to see you in the next video.